I'm going to share a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. I started leading physical tours with EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I've since expanded my travel program. I've included adult only tours. I do most of those through EF Go Ahead Tours, um, but I do use several other organizations as well. I also offer family friendly tours. Most of my multi age tours are from teens through senior citizens. And as a certified travel agent, I can also book you on a dream trip as part of a group or on your own. Just reach out to me if you're getting started thinking about physical travel again and let me know where you wanna go and I can help you get there. In terms of the virtual tours, there are a couple reasons I started these and this series. So I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of travel restrictions where they haven't been able to work. And I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group. And I have since extended that opportunity to those of you who've learned about us through friends, family, social media, and what other, whatever other means you found us. We've done more than 40 tours in the last year since COVID has struck. If you'd like to access any of the recordings, they're all available on my website, girltraveltours.com. There's a virtual tour drop-down menu and you can access all of the past recordings there. You can also access them through my Facebook page and on YouTube. If you search for Girl Travel Tours plus um, Mara Walsh, you will definitely find all of the recordings. And we have several more tours planned for the coming months. I'm gonna share the screen with you so that you can see them and I'll go through them for you so that you have an idea of our future um, virtual tours. We're going to be looking at Western Scotland, Jerusalem, New England, Mont Saint-Michel, a Victorian look at London, Yellowstone, the Eastern Bloc, Salzburg, Milan, a mystery in Transylvania, uh, Northern Spain, Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe, and Argentina. Check back to register for the newly added destinations, but we do have a lot of these already on our Facebook page and our website, so you can start to register for those that have been added last weekend. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, we will continue to produce them. I know many of you have found my virtual events through Facebook and some of you are on Facebook now viewing this live stream. So welcome, but I do wanna once again warn you about the scammers on Facebook. No one should have, to, should have had paid to access this tour. If you did pay for access, you registered through a scammers site and not mine. You can always safely access our events through my website, girltraveltours.com, or by viewing my Facebook page. But be careful because the scammers, they copy my photos that I'm using for the tours. They copy my photo. They copy my contact details. It's very difficult to know which one is real and which one isn't. The way you know is that if you're being asked for a credit card to access or sign up, that is the wrong one. So please don't give anybody your credit card to sign up for a virtual tour. Just be careful and tell your friends the same. We'll just keep trying to educate people so that we save people from being scammed in the future. Okay, before we get going, I wanna share with you a few ways for you to interact with us. As I said, we have a Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar. Please save that for the questions that you're going to ask the tour director and for the questions that you want us to talk about after the tour live. If you wanna just chat with me and tell me where you're from or tell me what trips you have planned or what you've done in the past, that's fine. Use the chat mechanism for that. So I always include an interactive poll before we get started on our virtual tours, and this one is no different. I'm gonna launch a poll and I'm gonna ask you, what's your connection to Venice? I've been and love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the location or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. I can shout out my responses so that you all know where I'm coming from. I have been in love it, and I also have a trip booked. 
So I could um, go with both of those in the first two. So I'm gonna end the poll. I think most of you are getting your answers in. I'm gonna take a minute to let you get there. It looks like we have a huge majority of people with us today that have been to Venice. So Linda has her hands full and she's going to have to share with us a lot of new information for those of us who already know a lot about Venice. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna share the results with the audience so that you can kind of get a sense of where the knowledge is regarding this um, virtual tour presentation. Okay, so today's tour and all the other tours that we do like this are scheduled for 90 minutes plus the Q&A. So I hope that you're ready with a snack and a drink in hand. And as we know, a tour wouldn't be complete without a fantastic tour director. For those unfamiliar with group travel, a tour director is like a personal travel concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge, manages all your travel plans and makes sure your experience is full of education, it's stressless and it's easy to navigate. These are by far the most important people in our group. And I'll share with you via the chat and the Q&A a little bit later on how you can tip the tour director. If you appreciate this presentation and our guide's shared experience, but by all means, leave a tip and I'll make sure that she receives it. All of the tips go directly to the tour director once collected, minus the Zoom and operating expenses. I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only keep our desire to travel alive until it's possible to travel once again, but also allows a tour director to do what she does best and share her knowledge and passion for travel. Today, we're lucky to have with us a tour director straight from Italy, Linda Garofano. She is super passionate about her country. And as you will see, you will be impressed with her knowledge as well. So I'd like to welcome Linda and ask you to join me on the screen now. Linda, if you're ready. Hi. Hello, how are Hello. you? It's so I'm nice to see you. Great, you. Yes, and Linda, if you're ready, you can take over the screen and share yours and we can get right into the program. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Mara. I am going to share my screen now so that I can pull out my, uh, my presentation. Just give me one second. Um, okay, here I am, sorry. Okay. Perfect, ready to go. Hello everyone, thank you Mara for uh, the wonderful organization for organizing this uh, virtual experiences that give us the possibility to travel to these marvelous locations and for people like me uh, to share our knowledge because that's what we like to do. Uh, besides being a job, it's a great pleasure to show the destinations that have shaped our life, especially as far as I am concerned. Um, my cover page is this picture that I took actually uh, uh, on my last tour in Venice. Uh, it was a beautiful day and the light was particularly good. You'll be surprised, but it was just uh, an iPhone, not even the newest model, uh, but I was particularly lucky that day uh, taking this shot while I was waiting uh, to be able to enter the Dodgers Palace. Uh, um, I'm gonna start by showing you this slide. It is a map of Venice. Uh, but I like to start my presentation by saying uh, that Venice is a fish. We have a writer in Italy who is a Venetian. And when he tells stories uh, about his city, the place where he grew up, uh, he likes to tell the stories that he was told uh, as a child. I've always followed him because I find uh, his way of writing very fascinating. His name is Tiziano Scarpa. He might not make any sense to you. Uh, I don't think he's translated, but uh, uh, a lot of the information I'm sharing comes from the inspiration I take from him. Venice is a fish in shape for sure. 
before. And uh, being in the middle of the lagoon, I, I, I like to think of it uh, like a fish that swam all across the Mediterranean to reach the northernmost point of the Mediterranean and go rest there. Um, if you look at that uh, line up in the upper part of the screen, that is a long road. It is actually a railway and it is also the road. The railway arrived in Venice uh, in the mid 1800s. Uh, the road instead uh, was added uh, in the 20th century. Uh, that is my fishing line that keeps Venice attached to the mainland. Uh, it keeps it attached to reality. Uh, because I'm going to share with you uh, one, um, one, one impression, one personal impression. When I first got to Venice, I was a kid. I didn't know what to expect. Everything they had told me about Venice was related to the water. So I thought I was going for a vacation at the beach. And instead, I was not in the open waters of the Mediterranean, but I was in the lagoon. And this opened up a whole discovery for me. And every single mystery about this city needed to be resolved. Now, let me show you a little bit more about the location of Venice. Uh, here you have a picture from high above and you can see the surroundings of Venice. Uh, you can see that it's perfectly set into a lagoon. What is a lagoon? First of all, the, let me give you the size of this lagoon. It is, it is about 31 miles long and sinks 6.8 miles large. Talking in kilometers, we're talking about 50, five zero kilometers uh, of uh, uh, length and 11 kilometers wide. These are the measures uh, of the lagoon. Now, when you think of the lagoon, look at this picture. This picture gives you an overall idea of what the greater area of Venice looks like. Venice is right there in its uh, shape, uh, in its fish shape. Uh, and uh, the rest of the islands uh, are part of the lagoon together with Venice. Uh, when I have to describe what a lagoon is uh, to some young travelers or first time travelers that do not know absolutely what to expect, I say that the lagoon is something that is located on the opposite side than the sea, the Adriatic Sea in this case. Uh, looking at this skinny island uh, and this other one to the right hand side, Side, you understand that that is the barrier that separates uh, the lagoon from uh, the open waters uh, of the Mediterranean, namely the Adriatic Sea. If you're wondering uh, what that white line in the middle of the water is right there uh, at, the, at the entrance uh, uh, of this gateway that takes you into the lagoon, that one is a harbor bulkhead uh, and it is used uh, to help contain the tidal waves uh, that bring the water into the lagoon. But we're going to talk about this uh, also during the presentation. We're going to say something about uh, the future of Venice, uh, as well as uh, the current issues uh, of a city that has been floating for centuries. Uh, now, you might be curious uh, to know that the lagoon is rather shallow. The depth is about five feet, so it is not deep waters at all. Now, let's have a look where Venezia, that's how we call it in Italian, is located in Italy. We are in the northern part of Italy, and we are specifically in the northeastern part of Italy. The border to Slovenia is very close, very close to reach Croatia, very close to reach the Alps high above, and Austria as well. Uh, this is the location on the map. When we think of the lagoon, one of the things we need to say is that the geological changes that brought to the formation of the lagoon had a very different landscape many centuries ago. You have to think that the water did not go that far high into Italy, but the water actually ended at a distance that is nowadays that nowadays corresponds to the central part of, of Italy. So when the water in the Ice Age invaded the land, uh, there was the formation of the northern part and then of, uh, uh, of the lagoon, which is a sort of raised platform compared to the sea level. Now, 
let me tell you something about Venice itself. When we think of it, when we plan a trip to go to Venice, we think about the main sites and we think about everything we have seen on movies. We imagine this wonderful buildings, uh, the opulence, uh, the elegance of the city, but uh, very often no one thinks about uh, how this city was actually built. Uh, this city is resting on an underground forest. Uh, as incredible as it is, uh, in this forest uh, you see all kinds of trees, uh, larches, elms, uh, alders, uh, oaks, pines, all of this pie, all of this have been piled into the muddy surface. They have been placed into the mud and the lack of oxygen, uh, the fact that they have been in apnea for so many centuries has transformed them into something as stable as stone. And that's how the city is built, exactly like this. Whenever they clear a channel, whenever they have to work on something, this uh, wood reappears uh, from underground. And you really get a sense of what the structure above which Venice rests uh, really is like. Uh, now, when you think of the Venetian palaces, uh, we will see them in a minute. Uh, they look so beautiful, almost inlaid like lace, uh, a fine lace work. Uh, you need to know something. The facade of all the buildings uh, uh, of Venice are not the load-bearing walls of the building. Uh, the walls have to be light, and that's why you see the presence of that many windows uh, uh, that, that open up in the facade. It, Venice is a struggle against the engineering, the creativity of the Venetians, of the architects, of the artists, is the response to the engineering challenge of making this place exist and survive. Now, one of the main features of Venice for sure are the bridges. We have about 446 bridges around the city of Venice. They're all different. They are small, they are larger, some of them are monumental, some of them are simply functional, some of them are uh, private, the majority are public. And that's what you need to cross from one side to the other of a channel, of a canal. That uh, this, being the city built on, uh, on water, it is a constant wall up and down stairs. Uh, when I first went there as a child, uh, I did realize that people need to be in very good shape to be able to walk around Venice. Uh, after a while, you don't even realize it. Uh, the first time I went, I stayed for a month. And the first three days, I probably complained like never before. But then I realized uh, that human beings can get used to anything. The bridges look exactly like the ones you see in these pictures. Uh, you have a ramp that goes up, a platform, and a ramp that comes down, that descends down. Uh, what is amazing is that nowadays you see the, the, the side protections, the railings. Uh, those uh, were not always there. Look at this next picture. This one is uh, Ponte del Chiodo, that's, it, uh, that's the name of it. Uh, and it's the only one of the old type of bridges uh, surviving in the city of Venice. There is another one, but it is on a different island, not Venice proper. As you can see, bridges before did not have any side protection. Uh, the law was changed uh, in the 19th century uh, for safety reasons, of course. So the Ponte del Chiodo, del Chiodo is there to testify a little corner of what Venice used to be back in the old days. Uh, and look at the houses. Uh, uh, you know, one thing about living in a city like that is that anytime you walk around, uh, you realize that human beings have literally used every single corner of space they could find. This house, for example, is a house that is resting on water entirely for three sides. And in order to access it, you have to go through the back door. This house is located in the district of Venice called Castello Castle. Uh, and uh, a peculiarity is uh, looking at the facade, 
all the windows that, that used to be there, that, but then at one point uh, have been closed. Uh, why is that? Most probably this house experienced, uh, like many other buildings, uh, problems of stability and the works uh, that followed during the centuries had to adjust uh, to the problems uh, that were arising along the way. Now, Let's have a look at this colorful map. This colorful map is the map of the districts of Venice. In Venetian, they are called sestieri, uh, quarters, neighborhoods, districts. The historical part of Venice, the historical center of the city, is made of six sestieri. What is curious, what is amazing about this uh, district uh, is that if you're looking for an address, uh, you need to know that each one of these districts uh, has individual numbering of the buildings. Uh, and sometimes the digits uh, ra rise up to four. For example, in Castello, the one in blue, the digits uh, of the building reach 7,000. That is just to make everything a bit more confusing for people trying to find an address and imagine those uh, uh, those gentlemen having to deliver the goods and having to look for the addresses. Uh, now here it is a proper map of Venice where I have imagined to take you on a walk today. Unfortunately many people coming to Venice uh, they do come for just one day or max a couple of days. Uh, Totally understandable. Italy is uh, a very large country full of treasure. And of course, uh, someone coming from far away wants to see as much as possible. Venice is normally always the, the starting point uh, of an artistic, historical, and also a good culinary tour of, uh, of Italy. Uh, it is a city that deserves uh, uh, many days uh, to be discovered. Uh, but today I just assume that we are together for a few hours. Uh, and I'm assuming that you have uh, good walking shoes. So I'm taking you on a walk where I'm going to show you first the Doge's Palace. Then I'm going to enter into St. Mark's Square to show you the beautiful Basilica and to show you the Bell Tower. After that, we're going to go to Rialto Bridge. This is probably the most iconic bridge on the Grand Canal. Then after that, we'll pop into a museum. Uh, I have to say my favorite one in Venice the Academia Museum, and after that, off to my favorite church in the city of Venice, Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari, or simply the Frari Church. This is also the largest church of the city of Venice. After this iconic sites, why not to take uh, to take you off the beaten paths to see three unusual locations. At the bottom of the screen, the Square of the San Trovaso. That would be a shipyard where gondolas are constructed and repaired. In the middle, Scala del Bobolo. It's a beautiful and bizarre a staircase uh, that is built uh, up against a palace. Uh, and on the top of the screen, always in orange, uh, there is Calle Varisco, the narrowest street of Venice. Uh, Venice has streets. Uh, they are actually called Cali instead of roads. Uh, but some of them are incredibly narrow. This one will surprise you. After this, the, so the area that is circled in purple, that one will be the Jewish ghetto. This is uh, something I could not miss. It is one of my favorite parts of the city of Venice. And it's also very meaningful on the historical point of view, because in a city that based its fortune on, tra on trade, um, its political leadership on trade, the Jewish community played a key role. So let's get started by taking you to the first location, the Doge's Palace. The Doge's Palace is a little bit like the gate upon entering 
uh, Venice. Uh, when you arrive by boat, whether it is uh, a private boat or uh, a, a public uh, vaporetto, a public bus uh, in Venice, you arrive in the area of San Mark. And the very first thing you see is this impressive building to the right hand side with all those columns and arches. Uh, and that one is uh, the masterpiece of Venice, uh, the Doge's Palace, uh, a beautiful example of Gothic art uh, that stands right in the area of the monumental uh, square of San Mark. Inspired by Byzantine architecture, it cannot be any different. The Oriental influence is always there in uh, Venice and it testifies uh, uh, its uh, cultural and commercial relationships uh, with the Near East uh, of the Serenissima Republic, that would be the name of the Independent Republic of Venice before for the unification of Italy, uh, the Serenissima Republic and uh, lands from the Near East. Um, the, this is the seat of uh, the Doge, who was, this was the seat of the Doge, who was the ruler over the city of Venice, and it was also the seat of the Venetian magistracies. Uh, with the unification of Italy, this place became a museum. Imagine that in 2018, a million and a half people entered into this museum to admire the beautiful architecture and the amazing works of art. Let me show you now the facade. By showing you this close up of the facade, you really get a sense of how intricate the architecture is. Um, the palace uh, at the stands today it is the result of several modifications, uh, many reconstructions. Uh, each statue, each painting is located in this place in the world uh, to show you the power and the wealth uh, of Venice. Uh, it was founded around the ninth century renovated already in the 10th century. It was totally enlarged in the 12th century. Uh, in the beginning, it was a square castle, believe it or not. It was surrounded by walls with corner towers, totally different than what it looks like today. Then there was a fire and the fire, um, and after the fire, a reconstruction was needed. Now, at this point, they did not simply opt for a reconstruction, they went all the way for an enlargement. And uh, this enlargement uh, lasted throughout the following centuries, so also because other fires damaged uh, this wonderful space. The last one, and probably one of the worst, was in the 16th century. Another picture with this fabulous blue sky, uh, you enjoy more the architecture of the facade of the Doge's Palace. Uh, the numerous columns that, that you see on the portico and the loggia have capitals that are different from one another. And they were also placed there at different stages in the history. On the first floor, there, is, there was the apartment of the Doge, while on the second floor, the halls of the Venetian power. Um, uh, and in the attic, the halls of justice with the infamous chamber of torture. Inside, always under the roof, there was also the prison. And when this prison became insufficient for the needs of the palace, another one was opened uh, across the tiny canal that sits on the right-hand side of the, of the palace. And it was connected to the main building by means of the famous, world famous Bridge of Sides. Now, let me take you inside. This is the Grand Council Chamber. Uh, what an opulent view of uh, the wealth of Venice. Uh, this is where the Venetian nobility gathered when they had, for example, to elect the doge. Uh, 
or when they had to discuss important matters uh, such as uh, going at war. Uh, this is also where the foreign, the foreigners, the guests uh, were taken. And if you look at the walls, uh, they're all decorated with paintings showing battles, uh, scenes of battles and victories. Uh, it is a bit of a storytelling that is offered to the visitor to show off the power and the extreme care Venice had into man maintaining each single land that they had conquered. Let me give you a, a few measurements of this room. The room is uh, uh, 1,250 square meters. Uh, that is about 13,000 square feet. It is uh, 173 feet long which uh, is the equivalent of, uh, uh, of nearly 53 meters. And it is 81 feet wide, which is the equivalent of around 25 meters. meters. Definitely a place made to impress, not only in size, but also in decoration. This is the famous Bridge of Sides. Uh, everybody who comes to Venice uh, on a honeymoon wants to go see the Bridge of Sides. There are two ways of uh, seeing the Bridge of Sides. First of all, you stand on the bridge in front of it and you can take a beautiful picture of it. Or you do what you're supposed to do. As a, a, a newlywed couple, you're supposed to take a gondola ride and pass underneath the bridge. When you pass underneath the bridge, you kiss and that is a sign of or guarantee of eternal love. But there is another legend about this bridge, another tradition about this bridge, a tradition that was pretty much encouraged by, uh, by uh, poets like Lord Byron, for example, who wrote about this. Uh, the story is that the prisoners that were taken from the palace to the left-hand side into the prison, the new prison to the right-hand side, they knew very well that they were going to leave the world, the outside world, for a very long time. So when they passed by those windows uh, with a very intricate decoration where they could hardly get a glimpse of the sunlight of the outside world, they sighed. And this sound remained in the history and gave the name probably to the bridge. Uh, you can choose which version you like the most. They're both, they're both acceptable and accepted here in Venice. Now, Let's move to the next location, the beautiful San Mark Square. I like to call San Mark Square the real living room of the city. It is the place uh, uh, that was built uh, to be the place to be seen to be the place where business was conducted, conducted to be the meeting spot of uh, the city of Venice. Uh, it is 590 meters long, about 180, uh, sorry, 590 feet long, about 180 meters. Uh, the way it looks nowadays, uh, all paid, dates back to the 13th century. Napoleon Bonaparte used to say, the world's most beautiful drawing room. And it really is beautiful and impressive when you get there. If you look at the picture on the left-hand side, then that picture would be, uh, would feature the two landmarks uh, of St. Mark's Square, the Basilica, the beautiful St. Mark's Basilica, and uh, the impressive bell tower of St. Mark. Uh, but let me take you up close. Uh, here it is the facade of the beautiful St. Mark Basilica. This basilica was built in the ninth century. And when it was consecrated, it actually uh, was dedicated to St. Mark because it was uh, built to accommodate the body of the saint that according to the tradition, the Venetian merchants had stolen from Alexandria of Egypt. Uh, and uh, upon completion in, in the year 832, uh, Saint Mark was proclaimed the patron saint and the protector of the city of 
Venice. Uh, um, the structure, the first structure was destroyed by a fire and needed to be rebuilt. Uh, the one you look, you look at nowadays uh, is pretty much the third basilica in this spot. Uh, um, it is a basilica that has been designed, uh, taking as a model, two buildings from Constantinople, nowadays Istanbul, Turkey, the Church of the Twelve Apostles and the beautiful Church of Hagia Sophia, Saint Sophie. Uh, it was consecrated in the year 1094, and according to the legend, something surprising happened that day. You know, during the many works of reconstruction and restoration of the church, they had lost track of the body of St. Mark that had been hidden away in order to be protected. Well, at the time of the consecration, they accidentally found a body in one of the pilasters. Uh, uh, so the consecration corresponds also to the new, the, to the finding, the refinding of uh, the body, the forgotten body of uh, Saint Mark. Uh, let's have a look at this picture. I love this picture because it shows you several elements. First of all, the Venice is absolutely beautiful and night. Nice. It is a totally different city when all the visitors get away uh, after the long day when the city is ready to rest uh, the colors become absolutely amazing that gothic atmosphere comes down into the city and if you also have a little bit of high waters then you have uh, beautiful uh, op uh, beautiful possibilities uh, for pictures uh, like this one since uh, the day the basilica has been built, it has been continuously embellished, continuously filled with architectural beauty, with sculptures, with elements to ornate the facade and the interior. Uh, looking at the facade, uh, it's a real forest of columns and architectural elements. More than 400 elements contribute uh, to the beauty of, uh, of this basilica. Let me show you some details. For example, here uh, you see uh, the uh, statue of Saint Mark surrounded by angels and underneath him, you can see the winged lion of Venice. The winged lion is the symbol of Saint Mark and the symbol of the city of Venice. And then, these ones, uh, these horses, uh, they are located uh, um, on the upper floor of the basilica, on the facade. Although I have to tell you, these are copies uh, because the originals are not outside anymore. Uh, the four bronze horses uh, have become the emblem of Venice. Uh, uh, the origins uh, are of this of this uh, group of horses is uncertain. Some tell us uh, that they are Greek. Some others talk about. Uh, Roman age. What we know is that they were transported from Constantine in the 13th century during uh, uh, the Fourth Crusade when the Venetians took them to embellish uh, their basilica. And uh, some more decoration here. Uh, here you can find a mosaic. We're always on the facade. This is uh, a mosaic with the stories of the transport of the body of St. Mark in Venice. Uh, a picture of the interior shows you the colors of the inside part of uh, St. Mark's Basilica. Uh, here, the theme that is developed by the artwork, by this incredible mosaic work that covers, that paves the entire church, is the glory of the church. Uh, the dominant colors are very warm, especially the gold. And this seemed to dematerialize the walls and to project the gaze of the visitors to another world, the dimensions of the stories that are being told on those walls. Uh, the stories are those uh, of uh, the Old and the New Testament, uh, and literally, when you enter into the Basilica, it is like if you open the Bible, and page after page, you can read every single episode. Uh, such a beautiful experience to enter into the Basilica of St. Mark. 
And now let's talk about the bell tower. I chose a picture from away, from far away, because I wanted to highlight how distant uh, the, the bell tower actually is from the basilica. And that is a good thing because the bell tower that you're actually looking at is a reconstruction. This bell tower, uh, which is 323 feet, uh, about 99 meters more or less, uh, collapsed. This one collapsed in 1902. And the reconstruction you have in front of your eyes nowadays uh, is uh, uh, from 1912. The original bell tower had been built in the 10th century, but in order to reach it, its uh, final height, uh, we had to wait until the 16th century. Uh, when you are around the city of Venice, uh, this bell tower is the landmark. Uh, you know, in a city where a map is pretty much useless uh, and where Google Maps uh, is definitely not reliable, what you can rely on are the landmarks uh, and the very few signs. Uh, the bell tower of San Mark will always show you the direction to take. In the town, in the city, they call it the master of the city, the owner of the city, the most important one, definitely the tallest building in Venice. And now let's move further. The bridge of Rialto. We are along the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal is the main waterway of Venice. It is 2.5 miles long. And along the Grand Canal, there are only four bridges. This one is the most famous one for visitors. It dates back to the 16th century. And when it was built, it replaced a bridge that had been previously made of wood. Uh, the structure is very simple to read, a ramp going up, a ramp descending, and a portico uh, covering it. Uh, this bridge is normally extremely busy. The name Rialto comes from the word Rivus Altus, uh, the deep channel, and that gives you a very important piece of information. This area is free from flooding. Now, I show you this picture. This one is Rialto today. Uh, in this pandemic times, uh, Venice has been deeply affected by the lack of tourism that has highlighted how incredibly different the city is nowadays. The city is far from being the city that it was in the 18th century, in the 19th century. It is a city mainly devoted to tourism that has lost a lot of its population. The current population of Venice uh, in the last count uh, is uh, nearly 262,000 people. Uh, they say that the population constantly drops. It is not, of course, uh, easy to live in a place like this, but also mass tourism has played uh, its role. Now, uh, that might be the negative aspect of mass tourism, but uh, I have to say that uh, this picture gives us a sense of how lost we are without the main resource uh, of our country, which is that of people visiting us, of people appreciating our art, but also the work of our craftsmen. All these shops uh, on Rialto Bridge are currently closed. Some of them are slowly, slowly reopening and hopefully all of them will reopen soon. When you come off Rialto Bridge, you find yourself at the Rialto Market. This is one of the most ancient markets of Italy, the most ancient of Venice. Uh, the stalls for the, for the sale of the fish and the fruit and vegetables are much fewer than they used to be in the past. But I told you there has been a dramatic drop in the population of Venice. One of the things that makes this place interesting also for visitors is the fact that it is full of little restaurants and bakari. Bakari, B-A-C-A-R-I, are the tiny places where you'll go to drink something and eat some food, quick food, something on the go, something like tapas, but I'm not gonna anticipate too much 
because I will be talking about tapas, about Venetian tapas uh, later on. The market is open every day from 7.30 until 12 for the fish and until 1.30 for the fruit and vegetables. Uh, and of course, the food places that are in the market, they follow the same time, the, the, the same times. Uh, and now let's get again down the Grand Canal and we'll find another one of those four bridges. Uh, this one is in steel and it was built in the 20th century. And it is the bridge of the Academia. The Academia is an incredible institution. Here it is, uh, right in front of you. It is uh, uh, one of the most important artistic institutions uh, of Italy. It used to be connected, the museum nowadays used to be a part of the Academy of Fine Arts and the professors there were also in charge of supervising and protecting the amazing artwork that was in the city of Venice. Then eventually the two institutions got separated and this one is nowadays a museum. A museum where you come to admire the best of Venetian art, uh, art before the 18th century. Uh, names, Titian, Canaletto, Giorgione. You can just name one of the painters that made, that exported the famous colors of Venice throughout Europe, but deeply influencing the Renaissance across this country and across this continent. And you will find this here. But there are also other things inside the academy. Uh, you also find uh, sculptures and you also find some drawings. I'm sure that you might have seen this one. This is the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci. The Vitruvian, Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci is not always exhibited. Uh, so you gotta be very, very lucky to find it exhibited. Uh, it, is, uh, um, it is actually a work by Leonardo, probably dating back to 1490. Uh, and uh, um, it is a drawing accompanied by the notes of Leonardo. The real name of it, uh, we call it the Vitruvian Man, but the real name of it is the proportions of the human body according to the Vitruvius. And Vitruvius was an ancient Roman architect. Now, in Da Vinci's idea, this represents the ideal of body of human body proportions. Leaving the academia, we're going to visit my favorite church in Venice. My favorite church in Venice is called Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari in Italian but we simply refer to it as the Frari Church. Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari is a beautiful architectural example of Venetian Gothic. But looking at the exterior of the church, you get a sense of something that is almost, that is very severe. Uh, it's almost very plain. Uh, the church was built by the Franciscan friars who arrived in Venice uh, in the 13th century. Uh, this church is, uh, has an incredible contrast uh, between its external architecture and the interior. The interior is totally different. Uh, many art lovers uh, come to this church because literally it is one of the treasure boxes of Italy. Here you find so many works of art that you will be absolutely amazed. You would not know where to look to find something that will be absolutely shockingly surprising. Um, I already said it is in Gothic style. Uh, it, uh, it, the construction began in the 13th century and got completed in the 14th century. 
let's have a look at the inside. This uh, picture of the inside facing the main altar already gives you a sense uh, of how in how intricate is the in the, in the decoration in the interior of the church. It is divided into three naves, and it is also besides being a living museum, it's also the resting place of some famous people. For example, here we have two doges bur buried. One of them has been extremely important because he ruled over the city of Venice for over 30 years. Uh, but what people come here for is the fact that there is uh, an amazing artist that is buried in here. His name is Titian. And Titian literally made the fortune of Venice. It's the staple of Venice when we think about art, Venetian art that has influenced all the country. Titian in reality is not buried here. Now, I don't want to disappoint you, but I got to tell you the real story. Titian died uh, during the plague of 1577 and uh, his body was never found. So all we have here is uh, um, his funerary monument. Uh, but you know, as meaningful as it is, this place is considered to be the resting place of Titian. What did Titian do for this church? This one, the altar piece, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. Uh, Every single time I'm in front of this uh, impressive painting, uh, because it's really a large piece, uh, I am absolutely in awe. Uh, I, I just cannot think of uh, how intricate, how complex uh, the narration is in terms of colors and composition and uh, complex, but yet very clean, very easy to read. So let's read it together. We can clearly make a distinction of three areas. Uh, the lower part of the painting, the human dimension of the story. Then the central part of the painting, the transition, that, uh, the, tra the transition between the human dimension and the divine dimension. And it is the Virgin who is uh, the one who is at the intermediate, intermediate point. And then up above, the divine dimension. Um, this, uh, what is amazing uh, about the painting are the colors, uh, the many shades of red, uh, the warmth of these colors. Uh, this is the main characteristic of uh, uh, Venetian coloring style. But also the other thing that is extremely surprising uh, is uh, uh, the, 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 the actual, uh, how animated, the whole narration is uh, as if they, you were living in it, you were actually witnessing it uh, in person. Uh, look at the apostles uh, in the lower part. Uh, they're not simply witnessing the moment uh, when the Virgin Mary raises to the sky. No, they are participating. It's an active participated participation accompanied by gestures. Uh, uh, the gestures they actually design the drama of this moment. And then the animation continues also in the dimension where the Virgin is. Look at her. If you look at her face, it is serene, it is calm. But then you look at the wind that blows through her vest. And here comes the animation that is complemented by that incredible glory of angels. She is represented as a common woman, no intention to beautify her, just a Norman person who is about to raise to the sky. And when you look at God up above, an old man but still but the still vigorous who is there to welcome her in heaven this piece is a, a wonderful piece now there is a story there is a curiosity here the franciscan friars who had commissioned this piece to titian actually were ready to reject it. Can you believe it? Uh, uh, for me, it's hard to believe. Uh, the piece was started, the painting was started in 1516 and it was completed uh, two years later. And when it was unveiled, the friars were a little bit uh, doubtful. Uh, why? Because they thought 
that the lower part showing the apostles was way too human, almost disrespectful in the way Titian had depicted the apostles. But Titian was ready with his explanation and he said exactly what he thought when he had conceived the painting this way. The apostles uh, are, were mostly fishermen and he had represented them as the seamen that you could find in the, in, the, in the nearby area of Chioggia, part of the Venetian lagoon. So it's like a, an ideal connection between the history, uh, the Christian history as we know it, and the world where the tradition was witnessing, was living in and was bringing into this painting to make it even more real. What to say, when people, when the painting was unveiled and people, especially notable people, came to see it, they were all in shock. One, for example, was Hermann Esse, uh, one of the many people that throughout the centuries uh, had seen this, uh, this painting. And when Hermann Esse himself came to Venice, uh, to see the Assumption of the Virgin, he said that this is the painting of all the paintings, uh, like the masterpiece. Uh, nothing better than this uh, could be produced. Uh, I love this church, uh, mostly for this piece, uh, but also for the many other things that you could discover there. And now, let me take you to the unusual locations that I announced before. There it is, the staircase of Bobolo. It is a bizarre staircase, this one, because it is up against a palace. Uh, it is a palace that had belonged to other families before this one, Bobolo family. And uh, um, it is an addition. It is uh, uh, quite intricate. And uh, what makes it uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely worth finding is the fact that it is one of those hidden treasures that you simply do not expect, uh, especially in the location where it is. Uh, the family that acquired the palace uh, had a certain degree of importance. Uh, so the addition might be due to the fact that more artwork, more um, artistic architecture needed to be added to the residence that they had acquired. The reason why this family had a certain degree of importance is because they had uh, in their ancestors, there was a doji and therefore they were a prominent family. The second location, there it is, the narrowest street of Venice. As I told you, the streets of Venice are called Calli. And uh, in Venice, uh, we have about uh, 3,000 of them. This one is particularly narrow. This one is only 53 centimeters wide. I'm talking about 21 inches. It is uh, quite strange, but you need to know something. There was a rule in Venice. Uh, the regulations were very strict when it came to construction. You were granted a permit to build something as far as you left a passage between one building and the other. And normally this passageway needed to be at least the size of a person. In this case, most probably uh, there was not, uh, uh, not more space than this, and this was allowed. But generally speaking, Calle, the Cali, the streets of Venice can be extremely narrow. Uh, you have, uh, they, they go from 60 centimeters, about 24 inches, uh, to eight meters, about uh, 26 feet. So uh, they, they can be narrow, but this one is the narrowest one. Now, I am glad I'm not in Venice right now because the pandemic uh, might give me some troubles in fitting in that narrow space, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I wanted to show you this. Finding it is a little difficult, uh, but uh, if you took a note of the name, uh, you can definitely do your treasure hunt uh, when you are in Venice next time. And now let me show you 
our next unusual location, a place that not many people go to. It is called Squero di San Trovaso. San Trovaso is the name of the church. Squero is the purpose of this construction. It is the place where uh, the, the, the boats were repaired or constructed. Now, when you think of the boats, uh, Back in the, in the old days, uh, there used to be many different types uh, of boats. Uh, what has survived uh, up to nowadays is mainly gondolas. Uh, so square, squares like this, uh, and namely this one, are mostly used uh, for repairing or for the construction of gondolas. Uh, um, when you look at the construction, it almost looks like a mountain cottage. Uh, and in reality, uh, the workers uh, who came to work in these places uh, came from the Cadore area. Uh, from uh, from the country and uh, um, and and so did the wood for the construction of uh, of the boats. Uh, the boats are housed in a structure like this, so that when you're work you're working, they are sheltered, and that is uh, uh, what a square is like. The name comes from a word, uh, a Venetian word that means uh, squadra. And uh, um, in dialect, in Venetian, it's squara, and it is actually a work tool. So the name comes uh, exactly from the function, from what activity was performed in there. And now, the Jewish quarter. This is uh, the main square of uh, the Jewish uh, uh, ghetto, the Jewish quarter, the Jewish neighborhood of Venice. The first Jewish ghetto in Europe is the one of Frankfurt, Germany. But the Venetian ghetto was so unique in, the, in its urban shape that it became the model uh, for all the other Jewish quarters that came afterwards. The word ghetto actually originated in the city of Venice. It originated from the copper foundry that existed in the city for centuries, uh, but, uh, um, uh, but this for centuries before the arrival of, uh, of the Jewish. In the nation, that is ghetto. Uh, the Jewish had been working in the city for a very long time, but they had no permission to actually live. They were not al allowed to have their own quarter. Uh, you know, by the time, by that age standards, uh, it was a big deal to grant them an area, the, a concession uh, to live in an area uh, uh, all together uh, to create an actual Jewish district. Uh, and they were the ones, the Jewish themselves, uh, negotiated that. And I can tell you that it was quite a heated debate, uh, a debate that ended uh, on the 29th of March uh, of 1516, when the Senate uh, of Venice proclaimed this area the site of the Jewish ghetto. The decision had nothing to do with modern ideas, the modern notion of tolerance. Uh, because believe me, by segregating the Jewish uh, into one area, they actually, by, by, they gave them the freedom of, uh, uh, being, of belonging to a place. Uh, but at the same time, they segregated them. So it's, uh, it's uh, simultaneously, it was, uh, it, it seemed like uh, an extremely tolerant gesture but in reality, it was not. The Jewish were uh, living here had actually, they had many rules. For example, they had to wear a yellow hat and a yellow badge, except doctors, because doctors were, uh, Jewish doctors were very popular in the city. They were in high demand. So they could actually wear black hats. At night, the gates of the Jewish ghetto were closed, uh, just like the prison. Uh, but the Jewish felt stable in this area. They felt safe, so much so that after about 12 years living in these locations, they started establishing 
their synagogues and their congregations. So they felt a sense of stability. Um, the area was quite small though. In fact, uh, when it grew uh, back then, it, it grew mostly upwards. Uh, and uh, modern architects like to say that this is the first example of vertical city, of vert vertical city planning. Uh, if you look at this picture, this is one of the bridges uh, going into the Jewish ghetto. Uh, this is an excuse to tell you that uh, nowadays it's just like uh, any other district of, uh, of Venice. It is located in the Sestiere, remember, district of Canareggio. And uh, uh, nowadays you don't see any signs uh, of the old segregations. Uh, there, are, there are no gates anymore, maybe just the signs of the walls. Uh, where once they were hung, but nothing else. Uh, in reality, uh, the, the, the Jewish ghetto was assazed, it was, it was torn down, uh, the segregation ended with Napoleon, when Napoleon seized the city in 1797. Uh, when people visit the ghetto today, one of the first things they ask is what happened here during the Holocaust, uh, during the uh, Second World War. Uh, well, the situation was the same pretty much all over Italy. The Italian Jewish uh, felt uh, like they were integrated into the Italian society. So they absolutely did not expect the racial laws of 1938. They were taken by surprise and they were absolutely devastated. Many of them managed to escape. When the Nazi and the fascist in 1943 arrived in the Jewish ghetto of Venice, there were very few people left, mostly sick people, elderly and poor people, those who, did, who could not escape, who did not have a possibility to escape. 250 people were taken to Auschwitz and only eight came back to the city of Venice. Here we have uh, two important buildings uh, of uh, the uh, Jewish ghetto. On the left-hand side, the Italian synagogue, and on the right-hand side, the, um, the uh, Jewish museum. Venice uh, uh, is nowadays, as I said uh, several times already, a touristy city, and the, the ghetto is no exception. The ghetto is a place that has been touched by mass tourism. Um, this uh, has, uh, um, has actually seen hundreds of thousands of people come visit the Jewish museum, but the community, the Jewish community living here is less than 500 people. Now, the synagogues are the soul of the Jewish ghetto. They are built on the top floor of regular buildings, pre-existing buildings. And from the outside, they look like nothing special. In, in fact, you can see the picture on the left-hand side. It just looks like a normal building, a normal house. The beauty of the synagogues is inside. Inside, the, they are little jewels. Um, the, uh, the synagogues of Venice are several ones because there is a curiosity you need to know about the Jewish population of Venice. Uh, although it existed, uh, a large number of Jewish lived in the city of Venice, uh, the population living here never assimilated to form a distinct Venetian uh, Jewish ethnic, uh, ethnical group. Uh, they all stayed, uh, they all maintained they are separate, they're individual traditions. That's why we have not only the Italian synagogue, which is, uh, which is this one, but we also have the great German synagogue, the great German scholar. We have the Canton synagogue. We have the, the Levantine uh, scholar, and we have the Spanish one that would be the largest uh, existing in Venice. Now that we have seen some of the landmarks uh, of Venice, uh, we need to talk a little bit about what life is like in Venice uh, for regular people as well as uh, tourists, uh, visitors. Uh, here, 
the public, here we start with the public transportation. When you come to a city, the first thing you want to know is how to move around the city. And more so if the city is built on water like this one. On the left hand side, you see a beautiful picture of the Grand Canal and uh, the Grand Canal uh, is uh, flanked by many buildings, about 200 palaces, because if you were someone in Venice, you wanted to have your residence right there on the Grand Canal. Instead, the picture of this girl that is, that is taking a picture of us, uh, she looks like any other girl who is taking a picture of some monument sitting on the bus. In reality, she's sitting on the boat because in Venice, you go around like this, uh, on a vaporetto. The vaporetto is the public boat. The public bus company, boat company of Venice is ACTV. The boats run 24 hours a day. Line one is the one that serves the Grand, the Grand Canal. Uh, and some lines are, are actually only in operation during the high season, which means from April to October. This is the way passengers uh, uh, arriving at the airport, arriving at the station, they move around the city of Venice. Of course, you also have the local private uh, transportation system, the water taxis, but that is way more expensive than the Vaporetto. Uh, this instead is a small boat to transport goods in the city of Venice. Uh, it is called Topo, uh, mouse. And uh, the mouse is a flat boat on which it's very simple to load uh, uh, the goods and to go download, unload them uh, to the destination. On the right hand side, I took a picture early morning of this guy who had gotten his fresh produce, uh, uh, in this case, artichokes. Uh, and uh, he docked his boat and exactly where he docked it, he started selling his, his goods, his beautiful artichokes. Uh, this is the place in Venice uh, where the pr produce comes from. It is uh, the island of San Terasmo, the orchard of Venice, the fruit and vegetable garden of Venice. It is the largest island on the Venetian lagoon, but it is only inhabited by about 750 people and the space is mostly used for agriculture. Here, um, uh, for example, one of the most famous crops are the purple artichokes that you can only find here and they are a protected variety across Italy. Uh, this one instead is a bricola. You know, you go around the city, you have street signs, you have speed limits, you have warning signs. Here we have these poles. Many people think that they are just a way to dock your boat, but in reality, that's not the case. Uh, these uh, are two or three put together, and uh, in reality, they, they are a way to warn uh, the navigators uh, about uh, the direction that they're taking, whether the bottom, the sand bottom is too low and they risk uh, of touching shore. Um, it is uh, now, they, they have always been like this. They say that they have been in existence since the 1400s, uh, although the, the, the new ones, uh, the modern ones are equipped with lights, uh, and uh, with a little bit of electronics. Uh, there are some curiosities about the bricolas. Uh, for example, in the Venetian Lagoon, not only Venice, uh, the greater Venetian Lagoon, it is said, uh, the Venetian Lagoon is said to have 90,000, 90,000 of, uh, of these ones. Uh, they are uh, made mostly of oak wood and uh, uh, when they deteriorate, they need to be replaced right away. That is normally every five, 10 years. And one uh, curiosity is that the wood comes from European forests, particularly German, France, uh, the Balkan area, and also Northern Europe. And uh, a very nice thing is that nowadays, uh, there are in existence some companies uh, that recycle the wood and transform it uh, into beautiful flooring or furniture or objects of decoration, uh, very meaningful work, uh, uh, work that has a double meaning, a, a tradition, keep tradition alive, but also recycle something instead of wasting it. 
Venice and the high water. This is a serious problem that can happen at any time. You could be in the city of Venice and you could find yourself, your feet soaking in the water. Um, well, it is a combination of things. It's bad weather, it's winds, it's currents. Uh, uh, the wind that is the absolute, uh, the absolute betrayer is the Shiroko wind the southern wind. When it blows, you can be sure that the high water is coming in. That happens mostly when the seasons change, when the season changes. Um, it is something that the Venetians are quite used to, but it is devastating. I have to say that uh, uh, during the 20th century, the problem got really bad. Why? Because unfortunately, human beings have intervened on the bottom of the lagoon to dig deeper canals in order to allow uh, the oil tankers first and the cruise ships afterwards uh, to go through. Uh, so this human intervention has affected the environment and Venice is an icon of that. When the high water comes, the sirens blow, that can happen at night. The Venetians know that they have to get to their doors and they have to place a protection at the door that is normally made of metal and that allows them to protect the building from the water to flow inside. This works but sometimes it doesn't. In 2019, when the high water was really high, unfortunately, Venice got really devastated. The last time before that had been 1966. There are many misconceptions about high water, but there is one thing I want to tell anyone who intends to visit Venice. Uh, forget about feet and learn about meters, uh, because when you listen to the forecasts, uh, uh, you will receive the numbers in meters, uh, and it will tell you today we're expecting 140 centimeters uh, of water. That's exactly what happened in, 19, in 2019. Unfortunately, they predicted 140, but it was was 189 and you can understand how devastating it is. The lowest point of Venice is San Mark. San Mark is, uh, uh, the level of San Mark is only 80, 80 centimeters compared to the sea level. So when we say that the high water has reached one meter, it doesn't mean that people are halfway into the water. It means, for example, compared to San, to San Mark, you have 20 centimeters of visible water on the square. Now, of course, uh, this is a picture of me. Of course, uh, what happens in the event of high water, if you didn't listen to the forecast, you might have, uh, you might find yourself going out in the morning wearing the wrong shoes. If that happens, never mind walking to one of the many shops in Venice and you will buy this plastic wraps, sort of boots, but they're actually plastic wraps that go over your shoes and protect them. Uh, this is a trick that the, old, the, 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 the women of Venice uh, uh, used uh, since long time, only instead of having these boots, they had to walk, to walk into a grocery store and ask for two regular plastic bags uh, for goods. This is the way we intend to save that we we have we have used we have planned to save Venice. It is called Mose M O S E, which stands for Experimental Electromechanical Module. It is a series of barrier that isolate the lagoon from the sea in the event of tides, currents. So they raise from below and they protect the lagoon of Venice. And now, since we are in Venice, we might do uh, some things that are, are absolutely Venetian. So when in Venice, uh, you have to do the most Venetian things. For example, if you're in Venice in February, uh, definitely, it is time to enjoy the Venetian Carnival. The Carnival is that, is that period of the year where transgression is uh, the key, uh, where uh, when everything is allowed. You know, back in the old days, uh, the Carnival was not simply the moment of uh, breaking rules and going crazy and indulge uh, in parties and drinks and all kinds of jokes. Uh, no, it was a moment uh, when this uh, sort of of, you know, game of disrespect served the rulers 
to enforce the regulations. Like you're allowed now to break the rules. You're allowed now to be disrespectful to the king, to your father, to anybody in charge, because the rest of the year, it's uh, for the rules to be enforced. Look at the beautiful woman in the picture. This costume is uh, what we call a 1700 style. The 18th century is the style that has deeply influenced the, the Venetian carnival. It is uh, a style that well represents a society that indulged a lot in opulence uh, and uh, enjoyment, the enjoyment of life. Uh, but another feature of the carnival and not only of the carnival, are the Venetian masks. The Venetian masks produced in Venice, still with the ancient method, are used for carnival as well as for other moments. Back in the old days, men were using it to disguise their identity and women were using them to make themselves more beautiful. Um, there are many shops, workshops in town. The Venetian masks uh, that are absolutely famous uh, are the ones uh, that were produced uh, for the movie Eyes Wide Shut by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, and they were produced in Venice uh, by a shop called Cartaruga. Uh, the, the masks are produced in papier mache, uh, a recycled product made from waste paper, macerated in boiling water, and then shredded. This creates a material that is very resistant, but very light, and then they are decorated. The other very important product of Venice the Venetian glass from Murano Island, a work of art because it's entirely made by hand. Skilled uh, craftsmen that pass this knowledge from one generation to the other. Uh, they only use a few simple iron tools. There is no mechanical, um, no, no mechanical, uh, not involvement of any mechanical means. It is strictly done by hand. It is uh, a combination of excellence. Uh, the work of this craftsman plus the work of the amazing designers to create a style that will go through time. It has already and it is the symbol of uh, the excellence of Venice. And then the gondola, of course. Uh, if you are in Venice, you need to enjoy a gondola ride. The gondola originates in the city where there are no streets but only waterways that make boats the official transportation choice. Of all the different watercrafts that existed in Venice, the gondola is the most well known. It is an ancient rowboat evolving over the last 1000 years to become this sleek, graceful shape that you see today. It is unique. Um, its asymmetrical design allows just one oarsman to navigate the narrow Venetian waterways using one single oar. But if you want to look at one of the de decoration of, of the elements of uh, the gondola, here it is. The this part of the gondola is uh, the bow iron or the Venetians call it the comb. And uh, what is amazing, it's uh, that it's not simply something very functional because it has the purpose of protecting the bow from uh, possible collisions uh, and to balance the weight uh, of the gondolier. In reality, it is also a graphic representation of Venice. Uh, let's read it together. On the top, the hat of the doge. Here, there is the Rialto Bridge, the arch. Then this empty space is the basin of San Mark. These ones are all the different districts of Venice, San Marco, San Polo, Santa Croce, Castello, Dorso Duro, Canareggio, the famous Sestieri I was talking about before. Then you have the three islands, Murano, Burano, Torcello. Then you have another district over here, that one with the uh, Giudecca, and this band is the Grand Canal, a graphic representation of a whole city onto the boat that is the symbol of the city. And since we are in Venice and we have walked our way around the city, 
and we are tired. No, 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 no way that we are going straight to the station or to the Vaporetto. We first need to sit down and enjoy a drink before leaving this wonderful place. So why not to enjoy the typical Venetian drink, this orange one, it is called Spritz. Nowadays, you find it all over the world, uh, but all over the world, it is served as a cocktail, which makes the Venetian laugh because they don't consider it a cocktail, but just a, a simple mix. It is made with soda and wine and then some flavor. It could be Campari, it could be Aperol, it could be Sonar. But uh, what is amazing is the name. The names comes from the Austrian tradition. The Austrians ruled uh, over, uh, over Venice. And spritzer in, in, in their language is to spray. So it's nothing more than diluted wine. That's why the Venetians laugh when they think about the price that is charged all around the world for something that is not a cocktail, but a simple mix. In the middle of this picture, that I took at the market where I stopped before getting back to the train station for my drink uh, before leaving Venice. The drink in the middle is a Prosecco that comes from Val do Piadene, an amazing area in the province of Treviso, uh, not far from Venice, where they produce this fine Prosecco. And that area is also a UNESCO protected landscape. If you drink wine in Venice, you better not uh, try not to get drunk. And that's why you accompany your aperitivo, uh, your aperitif, with a bite of food, a tapas. But the only difference is that tapas are Spanish. In Venice, we call them chiquetti. And the chiquetti nowadays got very creative with a combination of flavors, uh, deconstructed and all gourmet. But if you're looking for the most traditional one, here it is in the picture on the right hand side, a slice of polenta with bacala. This bacala is Venetian mantecato, which means that the bacala is transformed in a cream, uh, almost a foam, and it's absolutely fantastic. So I hope you enjoyed this walk around Venice with me. I really want to thank you and I hope you're not too tired. And if you want, please ask me any questions. Thank you, Linda. That was awesome. I just want to say thank you again. I know that this is um, a lot of work to put together these slides, and I know it's a lot of work to figure out the presentation that you do on foot all the time and, and put it into this presentation, but you did an awesome job. Not only did you stay uh, true to the time, but you took us on a journey by foot and you simulated a, a tour and you, you fulfilled all the requirements. So thank you so very much. I know a lot of people were chatting me during the time, just saying how wonderful it was and how much they appreciated you. So thank you. Before we get into the q and I'm just gonna mention, um, I did mention before, and we had a lot of questions about it, so I might as well take it off the table right now. I do have a few tours that go to Italy. Um, next year, we're doing a European Palooza tour um, during the summer that's a multi-age tour, and it does start in Italy. We're doing um, Rome, Florence, Venice, um, Pisa, and then going on to several other countries all over um, Europe and the UK. I have a tour in September 2022, which is Venice, Florence, and Rome with the Sorrento extension. And then in 2024, we're doing a, a Southern Italy tour. So if you're interested in any of those tours or the tours that you see now on the slide that's up next to me, just send me an email at marawalsh at gmail.com. It's very hard for me to answer everybody in the chat with thoughtful answers. Um, so I'd prefer to have those via email so that I can send you the necessary information. Okay, so I think I've given Linda a minute or two to have a breath and also take a sip of maybe, I don't know, um, a, a little bit, <laughs> okay, a little water. We're going to go into the Q&A at this point, Linda, and I've been reading the uh, questions, so I've kind of 
put some of them together if you wouldn't mind. So one of the top questions is always, you know, the effects of the pandemic. So one, in the news, especially in North America, we've seen a lot of good things come out of the pandemic in um, Venice. Uh, the ecosystem has cleared, perhaps. If you would tell us a little bit about that, but also then tell us the COVID restrictions that might be going on right now, and um, how has the pandemic affected um, Venice other than the obvious, which is tourism um, has been squashed? Absolutely. Um, the pandemic, uh, which hit that area of Italy really bad, uh, because I know that on the news we read that it hit Milan mostly, but also the Venetian area uh, was definitely uh, deeply affected. Some the, the first person who died in Italy was in the Veneto region, so the region of Venice. Uh, um, the pandemic has seen a sudden change in the lifestyle of Venice. Uh, the lack of tourism has been a tragedy for Venetians, but it has been a sort of a gift for the lagoon. The lagoon has taken a moment of rest uh, from the heavy traffic what came out from this pandemic is this amazing brainstorming that I hope is not just going to stay a brainstorming, but it's going to translate into facts. It was announced that cruise ships will not be allowed into the lagoon any longer, which means that the, the, these cruise ships actually will have to stay uh, on the side of the open sea, of the Adriatic Sea. So for those of you who are thinking, wow, I really wanted to take a cruise going to Venice and now I won't be able to go. No, you will. It's just that that cruise ship is not gonna go in front of San Mark. You will have to do what travelers have done for centuries, get off the boat and walk to San Mark because Venice is a city that needs to be enjoyed on a gondola or on your feet. In terms of restrictions, we are transitioning into a new chapter of our pandemic history. Today, they are announcing that some entrance into public areas, some public events and areas will be uh, only for those who can submit a green pass, which is the certification of vaccination. Of course, this is implemented temporarily because of the raise of the cases in other European countries. We're still at a moderate pace, but you know, if we want to learn from the example of last summer, we better take things at a slow pace and control them in order to stay open rather than closing again. Okay, so let's go back to the Doge Palace and talk a little bit about that. Um, there were some questions related to that. One, you gave us some great inside photos. Are we able to physically visit the inside? And can you talk a little bit about why that palace came about? Whose decision was it? And what was, was it used in the earlier years? Okay, the palace. Uh is a museum nowadays. Now, let me tell you the truth. Uh, many things might change after COVID. So we have to look at the new regulations, but like every other museum, you have to have your bags inspected when you go in. Uh, it is better to have a reservation uh, planning your visit to the Doge's Palace. Uh, and uh, uh, as a museum, is a, it, it, it is open uh, according to the time schedule. Now, the schedule these days is a little messed up because, of course, they, they don't have enough tourism. So some uh, sometime during this pandemic, uh, uh, they have actually uh, kept it closed. When it comes to the significance of the place, the Doge's Palace, uh, uh, it is the palace of the ruler of Venice, uh, the Doge, but it was also the palace of the institutions, uh, the institutions that ruled the politics, the justice, uh, and that's why all in one palace uh, you had, let's say, something like in another place would be the king, you had him there, then you had the magistrates, and you had the justice being regulated there from the beginning of the process to the end of the process, which included the prison. So it is the real center of power. You know, one of the things that is amazing about Venice is everything is always condensated in one single space, uh, almost like the physics of the city. Uh, it is, uh, everything is very rationally organized, uh, and Dodger's Palace is a very good 
translation of that in practical life. Uh, then, of course, with the end of the Serenissima Republic uh, and uh, when Italy became uh, a united country, a kingdom, uh, and Venice was part of that kingdom, the palace was turned from a center of power into a museum. Great. Let's talk about the population of Venice. Um, talk about the residents versus the tourists. What's the what's the percentage of uh, residents? Um, what is the population of Venice? And in a in a year like the one we just had, how empty is Venice? And what are how are they surviving? The people of the Venetians. The, the population of Venice, as I said before, it's uh, nearly 200, 262,000 people. Uh, those are the official residents. Uh, um, in reality, many of them uh, are residents in the city of Venice, uh, uh, but might not live in the city of Venice, but they live uh, on the mainland. Um, that is more so during the pandemic because lack of business does not, uh, does not need them in presence into the city of Venice. Uh, let me give you a first-hand experience. Uh, uh, I go to Venice very often and uh, I always stay in this little place uh, that is owned by a family. It was the house of their grandmother. And of course, uh, they decided to turn it into a small b, &B. And I stay with them because uh, they, I get the sense of family, a Venetian family, and we have been in touch for the entire pandemic. Uh, and it's amazing because uh, the gentleman told me that one of the things uh, that uh, he found the, the scariest uh, was that literally it not, it did not hear a sound for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, that gives you the sense of isolation of a city that has less and less population, more and more tourists, uh, and all of a sudden doesn't have both of them. Yeah, so you talked about the industry and how, you know, obviously in this day and age, tourism is a large industry. Um, but it, back in the day, Venice was the printing place of the world, right? They they were the start of the printing plants. Do they still exist in Venice? And then if, if not, talk to us about Venetian lace, talk to us about, you know, the glass. What of those traditional industries are still going strong and not just for tourism, but really for profitability? I have to be honest to you. Uh, when it comes to all the traditional activities, uh, many of them have uh, transitioned into tourist attractions. Uh, that is the case uh, with most of them, what I would say, not the glass. The glass is a matter of high design. So that finds always a marketplace uh, everywhere across the continent, across the world. Uh, but when you think of Venice, uh, it is true that uh, the main industry is tourism, but you also have to bear in mind that Veneto is one of the wealthiest Italian regions. And there is heavy industry all around Venice. Uh, most of the people of Venice are actually employed uh, in all the industrial activities uh, of uh, the Venetian area. Uh, and that is also the reason why the area was so much affected by pollution and so much the, in the lagoon was reshaped. Uh, the ancient Venetians were very respectful. They really uh, took maximum care into not allowing the water to come into the city and preventing the mud from invading the city. Then instead we went to, to, to you know, uh, tickle that mud underneath there and uh, dig those canals uh, and uh, we created lots of damage and it was made in the 20th century for the sake of uh, uh, money. Mm -hmm. I have a couple random questions I'm going to go through and these will be quick ones for you to answer. So um, one of the viewers says that 20 years ago they did a Venice gondola tour and the guide pointed out Marco Polo's residence. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is it a myth? Is it true? And um, do you have anything to add on that? No, it, it is a place that they show on the gondola ride. Like many things uh, that have deeply changed, uh, I'm sure that the building that you see nowadays does not have uh, uh, 100% in common with the building back at the time of Marco Polo, but it is a thing that is shown on the gondola ride. Um, yes, they, they, do, they do show corners of the city related to Marco Polo, great explorer, the Venice, the Venetian fame brought to the world. Then they show you corners of Casanova. Those are a little bit more legendary. Uh, and, uh, and then they show you the Venice of Carlo Goldoni that is our own little special Shakespeare. 
it is uh, it is the author that has the importance in, in Italy that Shakespeare has in England. So, so those speaking, are the corners of the famous people of Venice. Speaking of, of that, how much live performance, and we're going to segue from this into Carnival afterwards, but how much live performance is important in the culture of Venice? Absolutely important. Uh, Venice is one of those places where it's interesting to go to the theater, to go to the churches that actually perform music. And music is a vital part of, uh, of mm -hmm. the Venetian society. It is uh, anytime there is an event, it is connected to a performance. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, remember that it's also the place uh, of the Biennale, which is this cultural institution that embraces all types of art, uh, artistic, cultural activities. Uh, so yes, Venice and culture, uh, they're twin brothers. So let's segue into carnival time. So, you know, I'm assuming it's a crazy time. Why don't you talk a little bit about a tourist coming during carnival? What are your tips and tricks and if you plan to visit at that time? Absolutely. Carnival is a long, a long moment. Uh, so it's not just uh, related to Mardi Gras. OK, and that is a consolation because in reality, that day is super crowded. Uh, but during the, the, the time that precedes that, uh, it's an amazing moment of the year. It is the colors of Venice coming all together. It is Venice turning into a stage. And uh, uh, you can simply walk uh, around the streets and enjoy this mask that softly walk. They take this uh, slow paced walking and they just let people admire them and take pictures of them. Or you can do the big things. You can go online and book some of the events that are planned for the entire carnival period. Uh, some of them are extremely prices, the pricey, expensive and absolutely difficult to get to. But carnival is a, is a time of the year that if you have not seen it and you have already been to Venice, uh, you probably want to take into consideration visiting it, Carnal. So we did a wonderful tour and you showed everybody the way that you would walk around. If you were going to plan a visit to Venice, how many days do you think that would be ideal to see the sites that we saw and to do Venice justice? If you, if you don't want to, to actually go crazy, because Venice is also a place where you, you get lost very easily. And the beauty of it is to get lost. Let, let the city absorb you, let the city capture you. And uh, to me, if you don't have much time, at least three days at least three days devoted to Venice. Uh, because otherwise it's really, really just a bite that will leave you a bitter flavor in your mouth. How long does it take to walk from one side to the other? If you don't get lost, uh, I would yeah. say, for example, from San Mark to Rialto, with my attention being caught by the many shops, uh, uh, it takes me no more than 20 minutes. Uh, OK, but so it's very doable. Walk. But it at the same doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have a lot of travelers who have maybe mobility issues or have trouble. I know Italy is not the best country for um, for those for those tourists with mobility issues. Is there any way to visit Venice if you have mobility issues? It is difficult. It is do anything is doable when you really you really desire something. But I have to be honest, just the fact of going up and down the bridges is not simple. Some of them have the ramp that allow people to go up and down uh, people with mobility issues. Uh, but it is hard if you have mobility issues uh, and you really want to enjoy the city of Venice. Uh, I suggest a very centrally located hotel. Uh, maybe spending a bit more money and staying in the area of San Mark uh, so that at least you get a sense of the city without venturing off uh, into areas that would be a little bit too challenging. Um, and uh, that is an area that is uh, easily accessible by boat. Uh, the hotels uh, are more equipped uh, and, uh, and more comfortable and uh, devote a bit more time to Venice uh, so that you really do it at your own pace, uh, but never give up on it. Good suggestions. Let's talk about the buildings and the fact that obviously we're talking about a very small amount, uh, a very small area, and there's a lot of development already, right? Are, are there height restrictions for buildings? Are people and companies building up, or is there any development going on at all, or is it completely exhausted? 
No, it is completely, pretty much completely exhausted. There is some building, of course, going on, uh, but Venice is not a city that grew out of its borders too much. If you compare the maps of a few centuries ago and you compare the map that I have shown you today, it's pretty much the same. Uh, but there is some construction going on in uh, areas where maybe they have demolished something. But if you're talking about a city that is outgrowing, no, that would not be the case. The majority of construction and uh, uh, enlargement is done outside of Venice on the mainland. Are there height restrictions to the buildings in Venice? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Even restoring your house mm -hmm. is a matter of getting permits and get it done in the right way. Remember what I told you during the presentation, it is built on a pile of wood, but that wood is in the mud and the banks, the, 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 they are soft and you need to respect them. So anytime you make a change to a building, you might affect the stability of the area. So it is something that needs to be taken into account and they do take it very seriously. Yeah. Let's go to gondolas. They're always an enticing part of Venice. Um, question about the folks that work on them. You know, can anyone be a gondolier? Do you, does it pass down through your family? How do you become one of those? Is it a lucrative business? Um, and then the gondolas itself, are they completely used for tourism at this point? Is there any use for transportation? Thank you for this question, because actually I forgot to mention that one other way of getting around Venice, especially when you are on the Grand Canal, in the very wide part of the Grand Canal, when you, the bridge to get across is too far away, you can get a gondola across the canal for one or two euros, uh, and the residents do that. So some gondolas are used for that too. Uh, the gondoliers, uh, it is, uh, um, you need a license to be a gondolier. Um, it is, of course, if your father was a gondolier, your life is gonna be much easier. It's like you lived your own li your own life uh, breathing that kind of air. Um, there has been uh, a few years back, uh, a huge argument about a woman wanting to be a gondolier and she never succeeded the exam. Uh, so that is still an issue under discussion. It is not simple. It is a category that they try to keep small and controlled. It is lucrative, yes, it is. It, with, uh, it is a tourist attraction. So you gotta be very careful. Uh, you need to, to, to understand, for example, when someone promises you something like, oh, you're a party of eight, no problem, you're gonna get on the gondola. No, gondolas have restrictions. Uh, no more than six people to a gondola, um, and uh, um, you, you might want to you want might want to book in advance if you're coming with your tour guide. Uh, you want to make sure that the tour guide is helping you setting it up because of the timings, the lines, uh, and the many tour operators that are included in their journey, in their package. Um, there are several gondola stations. Uh, your, your guide tour director is also, we all have preferences. I like to go off the beaten paths. Uh, we might walk a little bit further down, but then the, the emotion of uh, some of the canals is absolutely different than the one of the more crowded places. Mm -hmm. Talk about the economy um, and what it's like for a tourist. You mentioned, you know, staying at a better uh, hotel or a more expensive hotel that's um, on the square. How expensive is uh, is hotel stays in Venice? And um, just in general, you know, is it a very expensive place uh, versus other places in Italy? I have to say, yes, the hotels in Venice can be uh absolutely expensive. Some of them, the five-star hotels are absolute luxury. It, it goes without saying, uh, George Clooney got married in Venice <laughs> and his reception was something to die for. Uh, and it was at the finest hotel in the city. Uh, you can spend a fortune, but you can have a, a decently located hotel for the same price you would pay, let's say in Rome or in Florence. It's all a matter of getting organized in advance. You plan in advance and you get uh, uh, you get what you want and you can pay decent prices yes but when you talk of high luxury when something is luxurious in venice it is super luxurious 
Yep, awesome. Um, let's talk about the language. We didn't really talk about it very much. Um, is it okay to visit Venice and not speak any Italian? Is it something we can get by with? You know, a lot of North Americans are one language kind of people and we apologize um, for that, but it is a reality. How easy is it for us to get around Venice if we don't speak the language? Now, Venice is a place uh, having so much tourism where English is widely spoken and so is German and uh, some French. Um, and uh, um, in, in general, cities that are so touristy, you do find, uh, 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 you do find a, a good amount of English being spoken, not difficult. Uh, I'll give you an example. I have been uh, with some guests uh, for minor things. Uh, I had to visit the Hospital of Venice, which by the way, is an absolute museum, is one of the most beautiful and shockingly beautiful buildings in the city. And every doctor spoke English. So uh, that, that gives you a sense uh, of how the city is organized around the idea of having visitors. It has been a place of trade for centuries. So this ability to welcome people is part of their spirit. Sure. Uh, cars, did we talk about cars uh, in Venice? And let's talk about cars from the Venetian standpoint and then also from the visitor standpoint. Would you get a cab, a Lyft or a Uber or would you literally walk and boat everywhere you go? But you cannot get a car into Venice. So you get a car onto Piazzale Roma. That would be the, the, last, uh, uh, the last ground part of Venice. Uh, and then you continue on with the Venetian means of transportation. So private boats, private water taxis, and Vaporetto. Private water taxis can be incredibly expensive. Now, if you're traveling with a group, uh, you only travel with private water taxis, but you understand that that is packaged uh, in, your, um, in your tour product. Uh, uh, if you were to take a taxi yourself, uh, you might find it uh, very, very expensive, but there are vaporettos everywhere. So you can use uh, the vaporetto to go around the city. Although this is, a, you cover with a vaporetto a long, long distance, uh, but then you walk. That's what you do in Venice, you walk. Now there are no cars. Right, exactly. Um, so somebody asks about the restaurants and the shops. Um, are they mostly owned by Venetians? And there is, there is um, some, some prospect that maybe there's um, some Asian influence now. Talk to us about that. Yes, unfortunately, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, honestly, uh, if the Venetians let it go, it means that most probably they needed to let it go. There are some shops that are owned by Asians. Um, they are absolutely hard worker, working people. Uh, they own a lot of uh, bars. Uh, when I say bar, it's the place where you go for your breakfast uh, as well as your aperitivo in the, in the evening. Uh, um, many of them are owned by by. Asians uh, and um, also the shops. Uh, the shops is a bit of a mixed crowd, but you see more and more foreigners uh, either owning the places or working in the places, uh, managing the place uh, on behalf of Venetian, Venetian mm -hmm. people. Okay, let's jump over back to the Jewish quarters and um, the synagogues. We didn't see a lot of that um, in the pictures only because I assume that you didn't have them readily available. Can you visit the interiors of synagogues and can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, you can book the trip. You can book the visit of the synagogues. Uh, the reason why you didn't see a, a lot of pictures is because uh, there is a very strict copyright on most of the pictures. Uh, so I didn't want to be disrespectful. Therefore, I only downloaded what was free to share. Uh, mm -hmm. The inside uh, is uh, only on the Jewish institution website. Uh, and uh, if you look at the copyright, uh, you are not supposed to be using those. So you can go online and you can see the interior of, uh, of uh, some of the synagogues. And uh, through that website, you can organize your visit. Uh, um, they're not always uh, all of them open, but uh, a few of them are always open. And it, they give you a good sense of what the community used to be um, back in the old days, but still is, because even if it has uh, decreased in number, it definitely did not decrease uh, in the variety of different uh, ethnical groups uh, that represent the Jewish of Venice. Sure. 
Um, let's talk about the walking. Uh, we talked a lot about Venice as a walking city. How's the safety, um, especially for women walking about and how is it in general um, in terms of safety for, for people and for women since there's so much street walking? I have always found the city extremely safe. Although I have to say that in the last few years, uh, more and more things and more and more stories appeared on the papers or were told by Venetians, especially when I stay with that family at the B&B, they tell me that uh, it is not as safe as it used to be before. Therefore, if your hotel is really far away from the main sites, uh, you might wanna consider not walking back by yourself, especially if you are a woman. Uh, but I am I'm, I'm referring this to you. I am giving, I'm giving you this information, but I have not lived it on my skin. So as far as I am concerned, up until before the pandemic, I have always booked my, my b and that is by the train station, so quite far away, and walked back at night even late. But I do have to, to, to report some changes in the society. Okay, awesome uh, for that information. Now, this is normally something that we touch on in a tour. I saved it to the end and I was sorry for so many people that asked questions in the Q&A because I was sort of wrapping it around this. But can you tell us a little bit about the city of Venice, its people and its culture and how has it manifested itself in books and movies? So for example, we have um, the movie, um, oh my gosh, now I'm going to blank, Eyes Wide Shut, right? Um, there was a mask maker in that. And then there's some other movies. Can you, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but can you recommend some movies or books that would continue our love for Venice a little further on after this virtual tour presentation? Hmm, that is a good question. Sorry, I should have warned uh, no, you on that no, one. No, absolutely. I have to think a little bit in more. Uh, um, I have to, to come up with some uh, some ideas because on the top of my head right now, I cannot think of anything. But if you want, I could actually um, uh, look into my 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 preferences uh, and get back to you on that. Uh, you know, there is a very there, there is a distinction to be made. Uh, uh, Venetians don't seem to see themselves uh, so faithfully represented in international movies, uh, while those movies represent Venice uh, to the, the 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 large crowds that are dreaming about it. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is a little bit the contradiction. Of, uh, of, of the Venetian stage, the, the, the movies actually. I have a few recommendations from our audience. Um, Death in Venice, The Tourist with Johnny Depp plays- um, The only in one Venice. I was thinking about. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Um, Bread and Tulips is set in Venice. Um, let's see. Donna Leone's Detective, um, Guido Brunetti series. Oh, uh, yes. There's 30 that's of them. So that's a good one. So yes, this is great. Yes, this that. is what crowdsourcing is all about, right? We're getting we're getting some answers. And I, if I'm you, quite surprised about this one, actually. If you would like to add some things to that, um, you can send them over to me before tomorrow. Absolutely. And when I send out the follow-up email, I'll give some recommendations in the email to that. Absolutely. So, that that to me is a lighthearted way to end our virtual tour. And um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you to those who felt inclined to leave a tip. Thank you, Linda, for all of your knowledge and your passion for Venice. I know that I can't wait to go next year and and see it again um, in all, all of its glory. So thank you so much. And for thank everybody you. out there, thanks again for attending. And we will see you next week. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mara.